Imagine football's favorite Sunday. Now imagine it without salsa. We know you'd never commit to that kind of party foul. Instead, add fresh craving salsa. Our premium small batch recipes burst with big flavors. That means your game day guests will dip their chips and tip their hats to you. Yes, you. With fresh cravings, every host is a hero. Find fresh craving sauce in the produce section or visit freshcravings.com for where to buy. Crave goodness. I had lots of people before I set off were like, oh, are you are you nervous of, you know, strange people out there or, you know, oh, it's lucky you're carrying a gun or, you know, oh, I'd be I'd be terrified of, of just weirdos. And there's this real sort of stigma, I guess, about the outback having of there just being a lot of weirdos in the outback that are just sort of waiting to come and, and murder some innocent backpacker. So back at the very beginning of 2021, we talked to Sophie Matterson about literally walking across Australia, which by the way is the size of the US, walking across Australia with five wild, or as they call them, feral camels. Uh, if you didn't know, there are over a million wild camels in the Australian outback. I didn't know that. That's just as many elk that are in the US and in North America. So it's an absolutely enormous population. Sophie learned about this being a, a working in TV. Um, to did a story about camels and just absolutely fell in love. Decided after working in quote the camel industry for a while that she wanted to walk across Australia with five of these camels. So she literally caught five, tamed them, uh, and they are walking together across Australia. She, we we talked to her halfway through the experience back on episode six hundred and ninety five, and it was one of the coolest stories I've ever done. We're probably going to play it as the revisited this this week, maybe may, or or some point in the future very soon. Uh, but today's episode is part two of that. We talked to her when she was halfway through uh, before she had to end for the Australian winter, which keep in mind, the Southern Hemisphere, it's on the opposite end of the year. So their winter is uh, our summer. Um, so she took a break during the winter and <laughs> released her camels on this giant station, which is essentially a, the, the Australian version of a ranch. And so she had to go gather them up uh, a few months ago or back in the fall, their spring, our fall, uh, gathered them up and finish the journey, almost 3,000 miles, 4,600 kilometers across Australia, one of the largest land masses with one of the fewest populations. So what an adventure, and she's going to tell us all about it today. It was such a pleasure to hear from her again, and uh, if you haven't, please check out part one. Uh, if you you, it's, you can totally listen to this too, and then listen to that. But uh, Sophie, uh, she is moving now out to the Australian outback um, after living on the coast her whole life. So be looking forward to a book in the near future documenting this journey. All right, let's jump into the conversation. Hey folks, welcome to Adventure Sports Podcast. Today is uh, something we always want to do, but not always something we make happen, which is a follow-up, uh, an update on an adventure. And today we are talking with Sophie Matterson. Sophie was on episode 695, uh, walking across Australia with five feral camels back in January of 2021. Sophie, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mason. It's so good to be back. Oh, my God. W where are you coming from? And is that home for you? Yeah, I'm actually coming from Brisbane, which which is home for me. So it's it's pretty unusual. It's it's rare that you catch me at home these days. So, uh, yeah, but, but nice to be back amongst friends and family. Oh, man, I, I can only imagine. D does it feel different than when you started before all this. I, I know that you had a break in between, but you recently got off your second half. Is it, is it weird to be back home or is everything right in the same spot? Yeah, very weird to be back home. It's, it's amazing, you know, um, how quickly, you know, an adventure can kind of, I don't know, you can kind of file it away and, and it seems like a, a world ago. Um, which, you know, which is kind of, it's kind of sad, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm kind of missing it already uh, in some ways. But 
Um, I'm about to head back to the outback um, and take my camels uh, back to the centre of Australia to, to go live. But, uh, yeah, just having some holiday time after the trip in between. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you, you, I, th- I think it's a party in now. It's probably hard to stay away from the outback. Yeah, and if there's anyone I... who's seen it, it's been you. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so when did you actually finish? Like what was the date I saw on Instagram? It was around Christmas, but you know how that there can be a delay. When did you finish? Yes. Yeah, it was. I think it was, it was December. Oh God, I should actually know the proper date. December 11th, I think it was. Um, uh yeah last year so we sort of tossed up i tossed up for a while you know what date to finish and and covid restrictions played you know a bit of a part in that too and um because in australia it's been you know it's been quite restricted as uh, all of the states locked down again and so unfortunately actually I, I i finished on the beach which is in new south wales i finished at byron bay and a lot of my friends and family are from queensland where i am now so so um unfortunately there were people that that couldn't come to see me finish but but there i managed to sort of get it in just about a good time that uh they were about to open the borders and and uh my mom and dad were able to come down and, and sort of stay down that way well, I'm excited to uh, to get into, you know, leading up to the finish and, and what that was like, because uh, I, I really don't know. I don't know how it must have felt, but I did want to say, you know, when we last talked to you, you were in, in Cooper Petty, uh, the mm. place where they, you know, the, the, the homes are underground. It's really famous for a lot of other things, but you were had parked there for the, for the winter and, and then you, you picked it back up. How long did you take off and what was kind of re- recapturing or, or gathering the camels like because I, I know that was a process yeah yeah it definitely was a process so so i from cooper pd i actually took my camels down to the flinders ranges so a little bit further south, about sort of like an eight hour drive for the south of there um and i released them out onto this this massive station or cattle property um, and the problem was, though, I mean, which was fantastic for them, you know, they, they had a great summer holiday, basically going back to being wild camels. Um, but the problem was a lot of the station, all of their fences had come down because there'd been a lot of rain. They get uh, these sort of huge flash floods in the outback, which bring the fences down. And um, so we went out looking for them on motorbikes. And about two weeks later, we were like, well, we still have not found a single camel track. Uh, where are they? <laughs> so, so I was starting to get like a little bit nervous about it, and um, and they were being adjusted with with another friend's camel. So there was there was about a mob of I think thirty eight of them all together, and uh, so in the end we thought, oh, this is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. We need to get up in the in the sky and go look for them uh, from the air. So we, we hired a light plane and, um, and got up in the air and, and that's how we actually managed to find them. Um, yeah, they, they had gone a little bit of a walk about and, uh, so, but we, we, we saw them from the air and we managed to set a GPS coordinate and then head back out there with the bikes. Um, cause I mean, we could have been looking with the motorbikes for another, you know, several weeks, um, it's amazing how they can blend into the landscape and uh and you know if there's camels won't necessarily come to a water point if there's really good feed out there they can survive you know they're designed to survive off very little water so you're sort of not guaranteed for them to 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 be anywhere in particular were they together they were they were all 38 were together so it's amazing that that herd instinct was very strong and i noticed even when they came in as that big group my five within that were still hanging out together too so so they're yeah very very much a team so so you spent <laughs> a week or two looking for them and, and to be honest that's the extent of what a lot of people that listen to this show, the adventure that they have is about, it could be a week or two at the most a year or even every few years. That was the amount of time it took you to, to just for one step to get started. I mean, that's, that's a long time in itself to just get them together. I'm sure it was pretty stressful. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like, a, it's a, I guess it's imagine, you know, it takes two weeks to find your bike in the shed to get <laughs> right. on, the, on the adventure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it definitely, definitely was, you know, and I started, you know, my mind started, you know, oh my God, what am I going to do if we don't find them? Because I mean, really, they could have been, they could have been sort of eight, 800, 900 kilometres away. Yeah, you know, I mean, how big was the gone. area they could have gone? 800, 900 so kilometres across? They were, they were on a station that was was 900 square kilometres, uh, but then they had gone out of, they had potentially gone out of that area. So so we're looking at a, at a huge, you know, like over, a, way over 1,000 square kilometres that they could have been in um yeah which which was huge uh so so naughty camels had gone had gone walk walk about but uh oh man when i got to see them again it, it was it was fantastic and um i think one of the things that amazed me most i sort of had thought not only i thought oh not only am i gonna have to find them which was hard enough but i thought oh i'm gonna have to almost retrain them because they've been out you know hanging out basically what they felt like was the wild for, you know, six months. And I thought, oh, yeah, surely I'm going to have to put in a little bit of work here. But uh, it's such a testament to camels. They are amazingly smart animals and um, they just got straight back into the work and it was almost like no time had passed at all. It was kind of like, oh, hey, mum, how are you going? Are we off tomorrow? <laughs> Were there other wild camels out there or false alarms? Like, oh, there they are. No, that's not them. There they are. That's not them. Because I know that you had some encounters on this second half of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. And that and that's one of the things that, that we got, we were pretty lucky with. And, and that's why I took them down to this area, the Flinders Ranges there, which is, um, it doesn't have, no, it actually doesn't have any wild camels on there. It's perfect camel country. Um, but it's a little bit too far south and, and most of the the stations around that area have have kind of shot and, and controlled the wild camels. So so we knew that the only camels that we were going to see were going to be our camels unless they had gone a really long way north and that would have been a problem then. That is so wild. So you, you, you get your camels back. There's this great re, uh, reuniting experience. They all recognize you. They're ready to go. Um, I know they did put on some weight, so there was some issue there. And that actually led to uh, one of the stories you talked about the first time to back up was they all took off running on you um, all mm. at one time. And that was a terrifying experience. It sounds like there was a version two of that pretty early on in the second round across Australia. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was. And I tell you what, yeah, it, it was it was terrifying and, and took me straight back to that that moment, the first part of the trip, too. So, so yeah, like you had mentioned, they, they had put on a, a ton of weight, which was fantastic. And that is and part of the reason why I gave them that summer break is is they really needed to put on on condition because like any of us going on any adventure, you know, we we're working every day and 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 you lose you lose weight doing it so same exactly the same with the camels so they'd taken their six months off and and they'd grown fat and what that means for a camel is that they tend to get even fatter in their hump so their hump gets even bigger and when you're putting a saddle on a camel's back basically that is a saddle that is going over the top of the hump it's very inconvenient having a hump on an animal. Very inconvenient to put to to place a saddle on there. Um, so so, so I, I took I put my saddles on. And I thought, oh, these sort of aren't fitting very well. They're not fitting anywhere near as good as they fit six months ago. And um, so they were kind of sort of I don't know rocking around and not sort of not sitting great. And um, yeah, we had set off, and it must have been about. Oh, a, a couple of weeks in and, you know, I still wasn't happy with the way that the saddles were and and um, and we're walking along in an area known as, as the Udna Data Track and, and we'd started to, um, unlike last year, we'd sort of started to come across a lot of vehicles and, and um, we had a car come up behind us and um, it was one four-wheel drive and they were okay and then a second four-wheel drive and they were sort of okay and then the third four-wheel drive and they were kind of like, oh, we're not sure about this and and they had a little bit of a run, which is nothing unusual. They, they you know, will do that from time to time and, and I sort of turned around not thinking much about it and um, 
I looked around into my horror. I thought, oh no, one of those saddles is is really sort of leaning far forward. Next thing you know, as all these things seemed to happen, it happened in, you know, the blink of an eye and this terrifying flash. I looked back to see one of my camels, Jude, barking and barking and barking, and this is my front camel, and the saddle has come around his neck. It's hanging off his neck. There is gear flying left, right, centre, pack bags off here, pack bags off there, and Jude is just, poor thing, obviously terrified, you know, he's got a monster around hanging off his neck um, and he's bucking trying to get rid of this saddle. And I and I ended up basically sort of somehow falling over in the process at the end of the, the lead rope, being dragged along the ground with my head bouncing along the rocks at, at Jude's back legs, which is, is not a spot that you want to be, um, and, and going... And, so, and all I could think of was that that first instance you mentioned, Mason, where I was over in WA and they took off of me and I thought, there is no way I am letting go of this rope. I am not going to be the girl that lost her camels twice. I thought, I don't care if this camel stomps me in the head. I am not letting go. And um, and at the time I was on, I was on what is actually the world's largest cattle station so if I was to lose them there, that is going to be a very difficult process to, to find them again, you know, if, if you ever do. And, um, yeah, so, so somehow I managed to get him under control and as soon as I'd got him under control, he'd managed to get back, basically get rid of his entire saddle. And, um, and then I looked around and I thought, oh, no, Clayton's is going too. But in order to get for me to get the saddle off, the camels are so high, I have to sit them down. So as soon as I sat the second camel down, he drops to his knees and the saddle becomes even more dislodged and he starts bucking and I went through the exact same thing all over again, pack bags flying left and right and centre and the saddle round Clayton's neck and then he eventually managed to get it off. And, and anyway, after all this situation calms down, I've, you know, finally managed to take a breath I finally got the camels under control um and it's just a scene of absolute carnage <laughs> there's just saddles here you know saddles there pack bags over far in the horizon you know and the camels are, are shaking thing and and I realize in the process I've torn off an entire fingernail somehow and there's blood everywhere and so yeah, it was it was all in all a, a pretty a pretty terrifying experience again, and it, and it kind of, I guess it sort of woke me back up again to to the realities of 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 you know I'm in the danger I guess of working with large animals and and um you know and being and being out there alone and in, in such a a wide open and, and remote space. Uh, a little bit of here we go again. Mm, big time, but. Big time. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff to give someone PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, to 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 say that's a traumatic experience for your only lifeline. I mean I mean I know it's not dire, you're not on a deserted island, but it is extremely isolated and it is there's a real level of danger. Did did that give you any feelings of like I just can't do this again? The stress of it or was it Okay, how how do you process that is I guess what I'm asking and how do you come down from those nerves because it seems to be something you have to constantly deal with. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I I was thinking this just the other day. I don't think there was a moment in the entire trip where I thought no, I, I can't do this. Um I and I think maybe that maybe that partly came from the fact that the I guess the logistics with the camels it is so huge that it's sort of something that's hard to withdraw from in the sense that it's 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 like even if I was to sort of say no I can't do this I've still got to I've still got to somehow organize some sort of truck to come and pick us up and get us out of there or or you know or I've got to turn around and walk back which is often you know just as much of a distance as, as walking forward again so so I guess my way of, of dealing it with it was always to sort of just bring it back down to the basics really and and just sort of 
try and calmly and methodically just put one foot in front of the other. So so in this instance, I remember thinking, well, I mean, there's no point in being angry at the camels. They're just frightened. They're, you know, they're just reacting like, like any frightened animal. And, uh, you know, and I thought, well, and you just kind of, and, and the biggest thing is, you know, with, with them, you, you can't, you can't just stop and kind of give up because, because, because their needs for me on my trip, it was like their needs always came first. You know, you're standing in the middle of nowhere with, with animals that, you know, are shaking and, you know, they've got, you know, half of them have got gear on, half of them don't. So, so really the, it's sort of just taking it step by step and going, okay, well, I have to tie the camels up. That will make it more secure. I have to now sit them down. I have to go and collect this gear and bring it back to the camels. And all the while I'd, I'd really make sure I remember with that thinking, just breathe and just take your time. Don't rush it. Just do it slowly, calmly, and you'll get there and you'll be back on the road. And, and yeah, and I think it was probably, probably my biggest way of, of, of coping has been in some ways the routine and just, and just getting back to the routine and the, and the rhythm that we knew. And, and once we kind of found that again, you know, there was, a, there was a huge amount of comfort in that. Great words of wisdom. Very rarely do you have the luxury of just stopping and, and letting go because you, you just can't, you, you know, you got stuff to do. It's, <laughs> there's other needs. And I think no matter what adventure you're on, you know, too, there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's things that have to be done in, in any day, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, setting your bike aside and, and getting your pack bags off the bike and, you know, preparing a meal, it's, it's all those, those little steps that form part of that daily routine that, that sort of just bring you back down to earth, I guess. So once you left Cooper Petty, uh, I, I noticed the route wasn't as direct as other portions of the route had been. There was kind of some going south, south, uh, southeast, then north, then, the, you know, sharp turns. What was going on through that region? What were you navigating through there and how was mm -hmm. it going? Yeah, I guess it, sort of really the second half has been a, a lot more, you know, a, a huge amount more to contend with in terms of, um, of moving into slightly more populated areas and and um one of the well one of the biggest things was after Cooper PD I, I had to head south because um you come up against Lake Eyre which is um a huge well Australia's biggest salt lake um and, and it's it's a massive massive lake and this is is just a basically yeah a, a shallow a shallow area it's it's below sea level um and and it's encrusted with salt it's a dry lake and does fill up with water from time to time actually every i don't know five or more years uh if there's been good rains but um yeah so so you can't cross any of these salt lakes they're incredibly dangerous and and uh we're a big ex big issue in in the early days with uh with explorers in australia you know, they often came up against these these salt lakes and and had to to turn expeditions around uh they're incredibly slippery um and i found this out the tough way in wa when i tried to to cross a small section um you have this thin layer of salt and underneath it is is this this deep deep clay and very slippery and also if it's wet in any way um or even you know slightly wet very very boggy so you can actually get camels completely stuck in there uh and even wild camels will often from time to time wander into a salt lake by accident and and become bogged and and actually die out there so so yes i had to um scout around uh, around the bottom of this lake which which was beautiful and, and you know I, and i knew the dangers by this point i'd sort of i'd sort of cut my teeth and made made my mistakes in in western australia and and um so it was actually it was it was spectacular um you know seeing seeing this lake um around the bottom end and um yeah and then I, and then after that i guess the other things that sort of took me north is is you have um another big structure which is the dog fence um and this is a fence that is uh it's actually the i think it's the longest man-made structure in the world it's it's over five thousand kilometers um or one of the longest man-made structures in the world 
I, I saw you mention it and talk about it. And then one of my questions was, what is this, this dingo fence? Yeah, it, it's a fence that was built. I mean, it's sort of a crazy concept. It was basically built uh, for the early settlers to be able to run sheep in the kind of south eastern part of Australia and the fertile lands they built they were having all these issues with with dingoes coming in from the desert and so they built this huge fence to keep the dingoes out um and and it is still there and it is still in operation uh and it is constantly being updated and worked on and and it is still basically uh you cannot run sheep north um of this dog fence uh because dingoes will attack them so yeah it's this it's sort of an amazing structure to follow and and you know historically quite quite interesting and and it and it's also kept out other things i had other i had um farmers tell me that uh they remember that at one point in time there was a rabbit plague in australia and and they remembered going out and and it, it being knee high deep in in rabbits uh, along the fence line with these rabbits trying to uh, escape the heat of the desert, I guess, and, and move south into these greener pastures and, and them coming across, you know, yeah, driving vehicles out there and, and just driving over the top of a, basically a metre of, of rabbits pushed up against this fence. So, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> sort of a yeah, strange concept and, and uh, an interesting bit of history out there. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Winter can wreak havoc on your skin. Hey, it's Kayla, and it's not just the weather, but as a new mom, I've seen my skin change in ways that I'm not too happy about, but that's where the Skin Center has you covered. Their most popular treatment is Botox because they're the best at it. They've been ranked a top 10 provider in the nation by Allergan Aesthetics, the makers of Botox. And their best facial is what I got. It's the Hydra Facial. It exfoliates, extracts, and hydrates all at once. So save your skin from these winter blues and DM at the Skin Center MD on Instagram and mention code Kayla to get one hundred dollars off your first Botox or filler treatment or any skincare package. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Uh, it's just amazing. It, so, you know, obviously the dingo fence is probably something you were aware of going out there like, OK, this is going to be a big structure. Can't really cross it. I'm sure there's mm. places to cross it. But was there anything uh, besides the lake and besides the dingo fence that you said, wow, I did not expect to see this? Um, and had to contend with this either feature or um, encounter? Um, probably not, uh, not hugely. Um, I mean, I knew for getting further towards the East Coast, I knew I, I had to contend with the, um, what's called the Great Dividing Range, um, which is a range of mountains that it's, you know, basically almost – well, one of the one of the few ranges of mountains in Australia, because you know a lot of our terrain is very flat over here, but it, it runs right along, sort of just inland from the eastern um, seaboard, and uh, so that was a, I mean, for our standards, a big range of mountains that I knew that I would have to get up and up and over. Um, so, so that was one that was one landmark. But otherwise, I guess the biggest thing was was roads and. And, and that's what made the line so much less straight, I guess, this year was having to wiggle all over the place because I was pushed onto roads eventually um, and bitumen roads and having to try and find the quietest way, the quietest, you know, road I could and, and find, you know, safe places to cross highways and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, with, with the kind of being on a lot more roads, I saw you write somewhere on on your blog that you you saw thirty vehicles in the matter of six months on the first half of the trip, and you were seeing mm. up to thirty vehicles a day at this point. With that influx of people, brought obviously I'm sure added stress, but it also brought a lot of opportunities. It sounds like you found a or had a lot of chance encounters with people you knew or people who you knew mutual friends like it, it, it there seemed like there was a lot of those encounters can you tell us about that and maybe how either that energized you or how that felt yeah it, it was it was bizarre it was so I mean it, it's almost I feel like looking back on it now it, it's almost like I I did two entirely separate adventures 
Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, I, I can imagine. But, yeah, part one when I, you know, when I spoke to you last in 2020, it, it was, it was such an isolated trip. It was, um, you know, and I look back on photos now, and I almost can't even believe it. I was, I was way over in WA, which is, you know, the opposite side of Australia that that I'm from. I didn't know anyone in the state. Western Australia is is a huge state in itself. Um, and very remote, very sparsely populated. And then on top of that, it was it was COVID, so no one was travelling any of the roads anyway. Um, everyone was sort of locked down, and no one was able to come in and out of the state. And 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 so I yeah, like I, I think back to that now, and I was like, why wow, only maybe passed like you said, like thirty vehicles in in six months. Um, and then, and then, so it was a, it was a real shock um, last year when I got started again. Um, and I went, and I was still in, in a very, you know, don't get me wrong, it was still a really remote area leaving Cooper PD, you know, that's, that's very much outback Australia and, you know, way out there. But in the wintertime, you get this, this influx of, of tourists that are driving all the, the big outback roads out there, you know, people coming out in their caravans and, and seeing the country and and so yeah I, I went from you know walking <laughs> walking with you know seeing no one for for months to all of a sudden yeah seeing all of these vehicles and um and 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 yeah it was it's just amazing you know it was so much more even though I was so remote it was so much more a feeling of of connection I had done a little bit of work in in that region so um I yeah I I sort of knew people or friends of or friends of friends or or there was yeah no there's different people I knew about and I even had a, at one point um uh this big tour bus pull up and I thought oh here we go you know quite often the tour buses would pull up and they'd see the camels and you know we're a bit of a spectacle really I guess and um and uh, so they would you know stop and everyone would take photos and um and, and this time the this the tour guy gets off the bus and he goes I've got some people on the bus that know you I was like I'm thinking oh my who like I, I'm in you know I'm in the middle of nowhere and it turned out it was it was a friend's uh, a friend who I'd gone to school with, it was her parents on the bus just going on tour and they'd randomly spotted camels, I guess. And thought, oh, uh, our daughter Liz, her best friend is walking with camels. That must be her. So, yeah, so I had these sort of really bizarre cha- chance encounters and um, which, was, which, was, which was very cool. It was, um, you know, and it was funny, ironically, I think they were saying on the bus just before they, they spotted me, they were saying, oh, this trip really proves this, that Australia is such a, a vast landscape. And then they were like, oh, and there's someone we know. <laughs> 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 so yeah, we may be vast, but we probably have a small population, and it somehow seems to be that everyone knows one another through someone else. Uh, you know, that's that's why I'm so excited to explore Australia one day. Is a tenth of the population is here in the U.S., but being the same size, it's just it's going to be smaller. You know, uh, in the sense of population, but still, just it's a small world no matter where you are. That is too cool because I I find those kind of encounters extremely energizing or, or just motivating, or it just carries me through the day or the following day, at least. Um, were, yeah, was it any absolutely. motivation to you or how were you feeling at the time? Yeah. 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 Big time. I know what you mean. You, you know, you can kind of, you can get a little bit, I don't know, I guess pulled down by the sort of, you know, the, the daily grind of it or the, uh, you know, the, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot that's exciting about adventures but you know as, as a lot of your listeners and and people you have on the show will know is there's a lot that can be incredibly dull and boring um you know you're walking just constantly and so so those yeah those little encounters they they really give you some motivation and and push you forward and and some excitement you know i mean that'll be you know the, that was the highlight of of that day so as you make your way east, it's similar to the states in that it's a lot of desert out west. It's a you know not to the extent that it is in Australia, but it gets greener and it gets more populated when you get east. Just as kind of a, a rule of thumb, you described it as transitioning from the hard country to the soft country. Can you explain that to us? What that means and how you were preparing your camels for it? 
Yeah, I mean, it's um, they have they have like you know, people, the farmers out there. They'll often they'll often talk about the hard country and the soft country, and, and that can mean uh, that can partly mean to a lot of the country I went through at the beginning of last year was um, once you leave Cooper PD, there's a lot of, of what are known as gibber plains. Um, so the deserts are quite different. Some of the deserts are quite different than what you would imagine. Some are not just sand dunes. Uh, they are these these gibber plain deserts and it's a very, very bare country. Um, they are like these these beautiful red rocks, and they and they press down into a clay soil below, and it, it almost creates like this tiled effect on the ground, and um, and so it's actually I mean I find it I find it really spectacular country because it, you you look out and and it's just dead flat horizon as far as the eye can see and without even a tree, so so that can be kind of known as they the farmers will call that the hard country. Uh, the soft country they'll often call uh, the sand hill country. So what we sort of traditionally think of as, as deserts, um, these these sand dune systems. So so it was amazing. Like as I walked as I walked east, I I had so many different changes of landscape. I went from the, these gibber stones to these to back into sand hills, sort of back again to gibber stones. Uh, through this area of kind of um, strange sort of almost desert swampland um, known as the Bulagri. And, and like you mentioned, then we started to get into sort of more fertile areas. So all of a sudden I remember it was sort of quite a shock seeing, oh, there's a there's a wheat crop here, like, you know, and everything started to get greener as well. And, and um, yeah, we walked through this, this freshly planted green wheat crop which i i remember thinking oh this must be so strange for the camels to see this like well, what must they be making of this they've never seen anything like this you know and it, and it was strange for me too all of a sudden yeah we, we weren't um yeah we were in traditional farming country i mean further west in australia like you said in those arid regions you, you cannot grow crops it, it is just impossible that the land is is too hard um and yeah we i guess yeah that's another way to to look at it too as the soft country is 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 also sort of the east coast and and where the farming gets more more soft so yeah there was um we went through the wheat fields and uh, and then further on, you know, it gets even greener, it gets more jungly, um, you get into, and once you hit that great dividing range that I was talking about, you get into almost pockets of rainforest. You're really starting to hit subtropical Australia, which is totally a bizarre place to be taking camels. That is, <laughs> the rainforest does not count as their natural environment um so yeah very very different so it was, it was very cool to see the landscape change like that you know and to be able to get a, a step-by-step view of that was was amazing i loved it you mentioned the camels never uh never haven't seen any of that and i can't tell you how many people i've told this story about and told them you know you're not going to believe how many feral camels are in australia like literally over a million is what i saw like just as many and I'll compare it to the U.S. As many elk, wild elk there are in the U.S. or as many camels in Australia. It's like something just so many people have no clue about over here. I didn't have a clue until talking to you. Where does that area end going east? Where is kind of the limit of where camels go to? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So, so, I mean, really, like if you take a map of Australia, the wild camels are basically uh, – a circle, it, like if you put a circle in the interior, right in the middle of Australia, that's where they all hang out. Um, it, it, they tend to be in quite a lot. Probably that circle maybe is a little bit to the left or pushing over to Western Australia. So they they like it in Western Australia because Western Australia is is predominantly arid, you know, almost up until the coastline. Um, where I where I trekked. This year, I did have to be on my guard. There was um, definitely wild camels around. A little, a, a, I guess, a fewer because it tends to be where where I was this year in northern South Australia. There's a there's a lot more, as I mentioned, there's a lot more people, tourists and stuff coming through the area, and 
it's probably just a slightly more densely populated and so the the stations or the the um the farmers out there um as i might have mentioned last time will will cull these feral camels because they're, they're counted as you know an invasive spe well yeah a, a feral species and um and so they'll actually they'll shoot them so the camels will sort of bounce back and forth from the desert to this uh station country so they'll when the feed's good enough, they'll hang out in in these desert areas that aren't sort of owned by pastoral leases, as we call it in Australia. Uh, and then when they're they're short on water, they'll they'll need to come in and use the cattle troughs on these stations. And that's when sometimes you know they they run into trouble and and they get shot. Um, so I saw um, I I did actually have an encounter this last year where. I all of a sudden came up upon a a bull camel and I was kind of I was sort of getting close to to where they they had started to you know and and it's and and you know you ask the question where does it end it's it's a you know obviously it's it's not there's not a sort of defined line of where the camels kind of you know their their area ends you know it fluctuates from time to time and the best way to find out about it really is local knowledge so i'd speak to to the farmers out there and i'd say you know i have you know have, do you guys have any feral camels on your station have you seen any when you've you know been out and about or and and everyone would be able to tell me no i've never ever seen one on on omicron station but you know yeah you'll see them on tichicala station or um you know or, or bullo um downs and um yeah, so so I but I came across this this um this wild bull camel this day, and um and I thought oh no here we go again you know again it was kind of like a, a you know replay of of the previous year I thought oh no I'm I'm you know potentially gonna have to to shoot this this camel if he takes too much interest in in my herd, and so I had sat my front camel down and and I pulled my rifle out which I always have on the front camel because I want to be able to access it access it as quickly as possible and uh and this wild bull camel he comes over and he's huge he was a monster and he's muscled up he looks like a bodybuilder and and uh he starts blowing out his his what they call a doula which is it's a pink sack that kind of is attached to the to the roof of the mouth of a camel it's like a bullfrog sack and it's kind of like a it's a macho I'm bigger and better than you are and you kind of know that they mean business when they blow this sack out and so he's, he's blown out his doula and he's come marching over and I thought uh oh here we go uh and then I noticed oh there's actually a fence line there which you know I sort of wasn't expecting and he came up against his fence line and I thought I thought he I thought for sure he'd jump over the fence but he he hung out on on that side of the fence and I thought oh, okay well if he's on that side of the fence then I'm just going to sort of keep the gun out and I'll just keep walking and we'll see how we go and he's striding backwards and forth along the fence like with this look like I cannot wait to get to your camels there and um and anyway I I we kept walking along this road and he's walking along intently following us on the other side of this fence and then I noticed the fence came to an end but he kind of got caught into the corner of this fence and I had to go through a gate in order to get across uh, a cattle grid so these you know bars on the road I'm not sure do you have them in the US Mason cattle grids we do yeah cattle gates that's right. I'm, yeah, in, I'm yeah. in a rural area. We definitely have them. Right. Yeah. So you can't walk animals across them. That's what they're designed for. So I had to find the gate, you know, next to this. And and in order to get through this gate, I have to go like within like 50 metres of this wild bull camel who's caught in the corner of this fence. So I'm still like tentatively going over, opening the gate. He's you know, carrying on, blowing out his doolies, frothing at the mouth at this point, but he stayed behind the fence. So I sort of crept through the gate, sort of looked behind at him. My camels are all sort of, they're like little innocent kids almost next to this <laughs> Compared big. Compared to that one. <laughs> they're kind of like eyes popping out of their head like, oh, <laughs> who's this? Um, and uh, so so I, I take them through and and 
thankfully he stayed in the fence there and we managed to walk away from this this bull camel and um so so it was actually it was a it was great you know because i'd wanted for so long to get some photos as well of, of these spectacular bulls out in the wild and and it was always a situation where it was kind of a panic and i had to get the gun out and protect my herd and you know and 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 it all happened really fast when i was you know in western australia the year before um and so i was actually even able to to get my my camera out and take some photos of, of this impressive bull and and uh and then we said said good day to him and and carried on our merry way and uh and he stayed and um he got very lucky and he he um carries on wandering across the wilds of outback south australia there doing his thing i mean it's it's like being approached by pirates on the ocean that's the similar uh <laughs> right. you know a similar scenario just something so what would this camel have done would it just essentially attack your camels or you potentially uh is it literally mm. just territory stuff like that yeah, it's kind of, I guess it's it's not so much territory because I don't seem to have such defined territory as camels, but, um, but and, and they're not, and it's not a danger to me, but yeah, more my camels. So they, they just become very, camels go through, and I think it's probably the same with elk. You mentioned elk in the US. They go through, through a rut, the males will go through a rutting season. So it's their breeding and, and fighting season. Uh, and that happens to be in the wintertime, which is when everyone is in the outback. Um, and so the testosterone is pumping. They sort of almost go into this, this trance like state of all they want to do is, is mate and fight. And, um, and so I guess if, if that fence hadn't have been there, he would have probably, he probably would have absolutely not even noticed me, looked straight over the top at me, looked straight at my camels and gone, oh, there's a bunch of boys there surrounding a female and I'm going to fight those, those boys uh, to get to that female and and you know with me in a trekking sense you know there's there's ropes everywhere my camels aren't able to defend themselves because they've got those ropes and and you know what even if they didn't have those ropes they probably wouldn't be able to defend themselves anyway because like I said they they look like little school kids up against this huge <laughs> intimidating <bull. laughs> that's terrifying they have amazingly huge teeth they 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 literally have these these fangs the male camels that that look like the size of a bear fang um so they can cause a huge amount of damage uh with a bite such an un misunderstood animal is what i'm insane yeah mating and fighting what a life jeez mm, um, <laughs> so so you do this uh you know you're you're defending yourself you have a gun i think we did talk about that the first time i don't think you've been able to use needed to use that correct no, I did, unfortunately. I, I did, um, but only on the first year that I was out. So I did come across a, a lot of wild bull camels, a lot more wild bull camels um, when I was in Western Australia. Um, and, yeah, and unfortunately some of those I did have to shoot, which, which you know, like I said, I I know they're, you know, I, you know, and I would console myself sometimes with thinking, yes, you know, they're a, a feral species and every farmer out here he'll shoot them too. But... But I hate it, to be honest. And I know yeah. a lot of, of the farmers are the same way. You know, they hate it as well. They see them as, as big, spectacular animals. And, you know, most of the time they, they are not, you know, doing a huge amount of harm. They're just, you know, wandering around, you know, doing their own thing. But, um, but yeah, unfortunately, you know, it, it became a situation of it's 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 them or, you know, it's them or my camel and uh, my camels. And so I, so I had to defend them. So, yeah, so, yeah, unfortunately. And, yeah, unfortunately I um, did have to shoot a few. I'm sure that was not easy. No, no, not not at all. And, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I definitely remember having sort of the shakes after those experiences and, you know, wanting to, you know, and sometimes, you know, the worst part of it is sometimes you've, you know, you've taken all the gear off, you've set up camp and you've taken all the gear off and then this wild bull camel wanders in and, and you have to shoot him and, and then you're stuck camping next to, to the body of this this animal that you've just shot, you know, all through the night and my camels would often have the spooks and, you know, they'd be able to smell the 
the bull that I just shot and and then you kind of I remember just getting up in the dark the next day and being like okay let's get out of here and, and moving on as quickly as possible oh my god I did not even think about that what a vivid picture you just painted of the reality of doing this um just the un- dis- the discomfort that would cause the eeriness that would be mm-hmm. uh, kind of give an aura over the whole thing uh, that you just can't you, you know you can't, you just have to get away from you know any any time you're camping and you I was camping one time and saw a dead deer below me in the river and it just gave me this strange feeling the whole night you know what I mean just knowing it's right there it's it's you can't really relax yeah and I sort of like weirdly and I don't know whether I think you know I got a little bit when I was out there on my own for so long, I got a bit sort of superstitious. And, and I mean, I guess I've always sort of, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to the idea of believing in, in ghosts and so on. But I started believing even in animal ghosts when I was out there, you know. And I remember because there was these areas too that, that there had been rangers or just hunters had come along and they had obviously seen an entire herd of camels and they had shot a bunch. And I had this eerie knack of managing to set up camp in these massacre sites and just like not having even seen the carcasses until all of the gear is off my camels. I've spent a, an hour unloading and then I've wandered, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, 100 metres away and noticed there's this carcass there and then seen all of these other carcasses. And I remember this one camp was just terrible and the camels I could feel their energy and they hated it and it and it was you know there would have been about 20 camels shot in the area and it was just it was a weird eerie spooky feeling and none of us slept well that night wow sophie that's pretty freaking hardcore if you ask me jesus this is like a movie this is unbelievable um i know that's not a pleasant experience but my goodness that is that's that's an adventure that was definitely one that we got up in the dark and moved on from quick. What about, you know, being out there alone with camels? Obviously, the camels are enormous, not compared to the wild ones, apparently, but still for any person, they're huge, intimidating creatures. H- how did you feel as time went on? Did you feel like you just grew in confidence? Did you feel like your, I don't know, your 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 will was chipped away over time? Were you ready to be done by you, uh, by the time you got closer to the end and How are you just handling it all? Yeah, it was, um, I think as I got closer to the end, I mean, yeah, like we were talking about before, um, the, probably the, in some ways, the the influx of humanity, I found uh, it, it was a sort of double-edged sword, I guess, in some ways. It was, like you said, it can be, it can be really invigorating and, um, and I met so many amazing people um, across the entire journey. Um, you know, obviously more this year, like as in just more numbers this year or this last year. Um, and 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 everyone was so helpful. And and I will say that you know a lot of a lot of people seem to have this thing where I had lots of people before I set off were like, oh, are you are you nervous of, you know, strange people out there or, you know, oh, it's lucky you're carrying a gun or, you know, oh, I'd be, I'd be terrified of, of just weirdos. And there's this real sort of stigma, I guess, about the outback having, you know, because we, as, as Australians, we've released all of these movies. Like, I don't know whether, you know, anyone over in the U S has seen movies like Wolf Creek and we've had quite a few sort of famous outback murders, um, and it seems to paint this picture of, of there just being a lot of weirdos in the outback that are just sort of waiting to come and, and murder some innocent backpacker and, um, you know, a traveller. And, and, um, and I just found it was, it was totally the opposite. Um, uh, I didn't have a single strange encounter. I mean, you know, there's odd people you meet for sure, but nothing that, that, nothing that felt, you know, unsafe uh, or anything like that. So, so I have to say, you know, I, I take my hat off to, to all of the people I've met along the road. Everyone has been incredibly helpful, you know, and, and I've met, you know, that it is, it can be like as a woman, like it can be quite a sort of male dominated area out in the bush there. Um, and, 
And I've had nothing but help from all of the guys out there and nothing but, you know, respect and admiration from them. So so I have to, you know, take my hat off to to to, to men in the outback really for for um for being that way. And um yeah, so but but also I mean I guess it, it was hard in the sense it it became a bit too much almost with the amount of people. As I sort of mentioned before, it you know, we're such a spectacle. And I don't think I ever realised this in some ways because for me it became an every day. You know, I, I go walking with these camels every day. I'd been working with camels for a couple of years. So to me they're not new animals and, you know, I, I you know, I take it for granted what a novelty factor it is for everyone else. Um, but it it became, you know, every car wanted to stop and chat to us. Every, you know, person was just, you know, and, and you get and I'm, I'm sure other people feel the same way on different adventures because you kind of get the same questions over and over again, you know, where are you going? Oh, yeah, 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 100%, you know. And so there was definitely a certain factor of, of exhaustion by the end um, and, uh, you know, in some ways wanting to, to seek out campsites where I could be a little bit hidden or a little bit secluded you know, so that I didn't have people stopping on the road, um, you know, to chat because, because like, I, I, you know, I, I'd have, I have a limit to that, you know, I, I would be great for say the first, you know, even 10 cars, I could, I could answer the same questions and, you know, give the spiel and be happy to, you know, show them my camels and so on. But, you know, sort of after that, and then by the time you get to camp, you know, it's like, oh, I just would love to just sit down and have a cup of tea and I've just walked six hours. Like I actually just want to sort of shut up and, and you know, just be with my camels and just relax. And But then you still got people turning up when you've just, you know, set up camp and they, they want to have the same chat again. And, and um, you know, that, that I found towards the end, to be honest, really draining. Um, I can imagine. And so, yeah, there was, there was definitely a, there was a part of me that wanted to turn around and walk back again then at that point. Well, um, but, I mean, I don't want to be all negative about it. It was, it was like I said, it was, um, uh, you know, I don't get me wrong, I met some fantastic people and, and I had people that, you know, would ask interesting and different questions or, or, or people that were just so genuinely pumped and pumped about, meeting the camels and 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 I've always loved if I can have someone approach my camels and they walk away from it with a different love and respect and appreciation for these animals then then I feel really really stoked about that you know that 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 they've they've seen a new side I I feel like I get bombarded on a bicycle traveling much I can (laughs) imagine five enormous billboards essentially saying look at me here i am (laughs) and and not being in the mood to talk that would be torture um so as you get closer obviously it gets busier uh it's hillier there's more forest it's totally different i did read that you had to be very careful about what the the camels were eating Uh, but i do want to i definitely don't want to dwell too much i i think we have been a little bit focused on the negative my apologies for that um, what was it like to finish? What was the lead up? I know that there were more people involved with, you know, helping you with the logistics. You had family. What was that feeling? What was that? Take us through that experience because it's a huge deal. Mm. Well, in some ways it, it was, it was kind of beautiful because like it, the trip, this trip started very much as a solo endeavor. And, and as I mentioned, you know, WI was, it was very remote and I didn't meet that many, well, I just, you know, didn't come across that many people. And I, I left the beach on the coast of Western Australia totally on my own. Um, so it was such a change then as I got closer to the East Coast. For one, I, I realised I I needed the help. I really needed the help in order to navigate roads um, and really to keep the camels and me safe. Um, I mean, we're like, you know, we walk at 3K an hour, so we're like a sitting duck uh, on the road. You know, if a car's to come around a, a blind corner, 
you know, it's like coming across as, you know, a car parked in the middle of the road. It's, you know, it's extremely dangerous. So, so I, um, I actually had a, I had a very chance encounter and I actually, I met a boy, um, midway across my walk across the country and, and, uh, he had started dropping out to see me and, um, and helped me deliver, like he helped come out and deliver food out to me. And, and then basically towards, towards the, the last month or so, uh, he'd agreed to drive all the way out from his hometown in South Australia, which was a, a three day drive. He'd, he'd agreed to drive all the way out and basically be my support crew to take me to the East Coast. Um, and meanwhile, another couple of girlfriends as well who were um, who also adored camels and had owned camels, and they also they also agreed to to be my support crew too. So, so right at the the last month, I had this little team around me, which was which was a really fun way to finish. And um, and in the lead up to that too, I, I as I got closer to the east coast, I had other friends too come out and join me for a couple of days here, a week there. So so it was this really beautiful feeling of. Of, of, fi- of starting the trip solo but then finishing it and being able to share it with other people, other people that had followed me and, and had supported me through the whole journey and and, um, and get to give them a taste of, of what I'd been through these past two years. But, yeah, so in order to keep me and the camels safe on the roads, Jimmy had, had driven over and um, uh, we sort of worked out this little, this little team and uh, he put on a high-vis um, vest, uh, you know, like a traffic controller vest and, um, uh, and we got walkie-talkies and my friend Kieran drove with her car behind um, with a big sort of uh, traffic hazard sign on, on the back of her car. So I had Jimmy running up ahead, uh, running around blind corners, uh, holding up traffic, slowing down traffic with hand signals, um, Kieran behind me holding up traffic behind. And all of these logistics were just, yeah, it was a huge amount of logistics and, um, and so necessary somehow delusionally in my mind when I'd sort of thought about it um you know before going on the trek I thought somehow I'll have to work out how to do this on my own and I was terrified I I I thought how the hell am I going to come through civilization and roads and highways and 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 windy you know windy bends and um people speeding how am I going to do this on my own but this this little team united and we got this great little system going and it got to the point where it was like my friend Kieran and, and Jimmy were, were working so hard to keep me safe. I sort of felt like all I'm doing is holding the lead rope now and just walking. I'm not having to do, I'm not having to do anything, um, which was, which was really nice um, for a change. And um, yeah, so, so they just worked overtime and, and, you know, there was, there was this moment where coming into Byron especially um since since COVID uh, a lot of people in Australia seem to have sort of recognized that they can work from home and, and a lot of people have made a bit of a sea change and moved to the coast so the area around Byron Bay has become really really busy um and as you mentioned you know it's it's more mountainous and that the roads are windy and everyone's driving around these roads at you know 80 100k an hour um and there is just no I realized you know there is just no way around it I have to I have to be be out on these roads um so so there was one point where Jimmy had to hold up probably like 20 cars to let me and the camels walk down this road and Kieran's behind holding up another 20 to 50 cars behind and we're plodding along at 3k an hour down this road but no one could overtake us because it was just too dangerous so um yeah it was uh, you know I think thank god for for those two and other people as well that helped me out with traffic along the way because without the help of of them and the general public and generally as well drivers being great you know I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have made it to the beach how did your camels seem to react to all this were they pretty calm 
finish line, all these people. I mean, you know, what was that like? Yeah, they are amazing because I I thought when I was in the, the outback stretches, I thought, how are they ever going to deal with this? You know, they were right at the beginning. You know, I would have to turn if any car came along, especially behind the camels, behind the camel scares them a lot more because they can't see it coming. There's just all of a sudden there's a noise coming up behind. It's like a monster chasing them. So I would have to turn the entire string of five camels, which when we're all in a line, we're sort of like the length of a, of a, um, a you know, a truck or a long truck, a semi-trailer. Um, and, you know, I'd have to turn all of us round so that they could see the car coming and, and I remember thinking, how are we ever going to do this? Because we can't do this if there's like, you know, a car, a car, a car constantly in a stream of traffic behind us. It's, it's not, it's not feasible. And and to, yeah, to their credit, they they got better and better, and and they were amazing with traffic by the end to the point where they they were just totally, almost oblivious. Bar one camel, Jude, uh, I think somehow either in a previous life or when he was wild has this this magical, I don't know, PTSD from almost being hit by a, a truck, I would imagine, because he was just my only camel that never got used to it. Jude always thought that there was a monster coming up behind, especially when it was if it was a truck, especially he could hear the sound of a larger vehicle coming up behind. And, um, and that really did cause issues because he would dance around as in he would move around and you know try and kind of move back like move sideways and that would pull all of the other camels out onto the road uh which was you know of course incredibly dangerous and 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 cars seem to not realize you know as much as they slow down some people don't realize the unpredictability of, of animals um people just sort of see them sometimes as other cars on the road and think that they'll just act in a normal way and, and you know you can never predict what an animal will do and uh i remember coming up this one windy very fast speed road and everyone was overtaking me and on narrow bends and everyone you know everyone was just impatient it was the end of the day i guess everyone was coming home from work and wanted to just be home and and uh, Jude was getting more and more anxious and swinging all the camels out into the road. And, and by the time we got to the top of this, this hair-raising hill, I was close to, to just bursting into tears. I was just so incredibly stressed for the safety of, of my animals. Sounds like a theme through the whole experience. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, so I think really by the time I got to the end, it, it was... I I wasn't wanting to to linger in the trip any longer in terms of it was just every day was was tough work with the roads and um you know it it, it became it wasn't relaxing walking by the end so so to hit the beach was was really an amazing relief what do you think one of the biggest lessons is you learned through this experience something that maybe you were thinking about throughout or something that you've learned just reflecting on it? Yeah, I've thought a fair bit about this one. Um, and I mean, I think that there's, I think that there's obviously several. I, I'm sure there's a book or two worth of lessons at least. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's just one takeaway. <laughs> I do. But um yeah, probably one would be, as I mentioned before, would be that thing of, of really I guess, compartmentalizing or, or, you know, bringing things back down to basics and just really putting one foot in front of the other and, um, and just trying to get back on, on track and, and move forward in that way. Um, that was very much one. Uh, but I think as, as well, another, which I've probably only got from, from the ending of the trip and looking back on it is that, um, is that I guess it was something that I said that I wanted to do and and I went out and did it and I completed it and that's brought an immense feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment and you know I think there's there's so many people and I've been absolutely guilty of it many many times where I've said oh yeah I'm gonna do this and then I never do it you know and um or I'm gonna start the you know I'm gonna start this and then you start it and then you never finish it 
And there's really something to be said for setting yourself a goal, I guess, and and finishing it. Um, No matter how big or small, you know, it brings you a huge feeling of, of satisfaction and and a, and a really empowering feeling that I feel like I'll take to whatever else I do in my life now, you know, knowing that I, I did that trip and I, I said I would do it and I completed it. That's been a very empowering feeling. I can only imagine. And, you know, you say you set yourself goals that you don't end up doing. Well, I, I'd cut yourself some slack. You've been busy in the middle <laughs> of something else. <laughs> well, speaking of what's next, uh, I know that you're moving into the Outback. That's about all I know, honestly. What What is next for you? What do you think? Obviously, creating an adventure like this takes time to think about, takes time to formulate. You might not know what's next, but what do you know about what you're doing coming up? Mm, I think, I guess a lot of people that do adventures, they probably spend a, a, a fairly large part of that adventure sort of semi plotting out the next Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I think I'm I'm guilty of that for sure so you know I did did start to sort of cross my mind you know what what would be the next adventure and and I thought a lot more about um definitely you know I the experience of coming to the east coast was was an amazing one like I said I got to share it with family and friends and and um and and it was it, you know, it was it, it, its own entity and its own, um, you know, logistical exercise. But, but I think my biggest enjoyment has been from from the deserts and the remote parts of Australia. And and I feel like I only touched on a couple of deserts really. And um, we have ten deserts in Australia. Um, and I I think I would really I'm sort of toying with the idea of really liking to you know, of, of, of trying to explore each and every one of those, of those deserts. Um, and probably as well to, to do it cross country next time. I mean, that is, is one of the advantages of camels is, is that you're able to get off the track and, and go places that four wheel drives can't go. So, so yeah, I, that's, that's, I think next in the back of my mind, um, uh, at this point in time, there's, there's a lot of wrap up from, from this trip. So, uh, we're heading, like I said, we're we're actually about to to start driving tomorrow, um, heading back to the Flinders Ranges in in um, northern South Australia, which is where the camels spent last summer. So yeah, we're going to be heading back there, um, which is really great camel country. It's it's been it's been really one of the tough things about finishing here on the east coast is it's it really not ideal for camels because it it is that wet environment and so as you mentioned I was I was constantly worried about them eating something that was poisonous or you know um they were you know suffering just in in many different ways it's not the food that they're used to it's um they get parasites and all those you know all those nasty things that come with humidity and and you know bugs can breed and they they they're much healthier in the desert so I'm really looking forward to the camels being happy and out where they you know where they thrive and and uh for them to have a for them to finally you know end the trip themselves because really it's you know i've i've finished the trip i'm on holiday but but i think they're not really you know they don't really get their break until they go back back home back to their home so uh, you know i can't wait wait to see them do that so so they're they're going on to a a large station and uh they're going to have a a huge amount of area to wander around and sort of again get to to be back to wild camels hopefully we don't lose them this time hopefully we don't have to go up in a plane to find them Um, i'm uh, hoping that we can just drive out and sort of go see them from time to time and maybe even take them out for for um you know a little a little expert you know a little short weekend or week-long expedition here and there um and um, I'm about to sit down and, and write a book, actually, which is um, which is daunting and, and exciting. Um, so so yeah, I, that's that's my next adventure is is into the into the world of, of book writing and, and trying to get some of these these stories down on paper. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed reading your blog posts about this, and uh, I thought to myself. I wonder if she enjoys writing because you're good at it. 
and I enjoyed reading it. And so I would love to to talk again or hear what's coming up next. It sounds like the camels are going on to greener pastures. Uh, well, not really greener, but actually the desert. Yes, so kind of the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I hope it's not weird for you. There's a joke in my household now that's, um, you know, she's in camels now. When I told my wife about your story, she asked me something. I told her, she, you know, she left TV. She left this career to, to do this, fell in love with camels. And she, my wife said, so does she do this anymore? I said, no, she's in camels now. And my wife thought it was such a funny sentence that we bring it up all the time. Oh, she's in camels now. And it sounds like you're going to continue to be. So, uh, yeah. I love that. I'm still in camels. <laughs> yeah. No, she's in camels now. Not not that other thing. So, And it's like anytime we hear someone get a new passion, they're like, oh, they're in camels now. And uh, but... Oh, I feel so privileged that that expression has made it into your household. That's so great. It, it's been pretty funny. Um, we bring it up quite a bit. So I, I'm, I've told her I was talking to you today. And, and so we're, I'm ex she's excited to hear more. But well, Sophie, thank you for going over, uh, creating some extra time. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you the first time. Second time, even better. Congrats on completing a journey. That's that's the hardest part. You know, getting halfway through is great. Having to do that again. Oh, my gosh. Thanks, Mason. It's been so fantastic to talk to you again. And, uh, yeah, I love the podcast. And, um, you know, I'll be definitely listening to it on my on my long drive back to the desert over the next couple of days. So, uh, but, yeah, keep in touch and, and looking forward to chatting again soon. <laughs> looking forward to it. All right. Well, we'll talk soon. I, I better run. All right. Have a great day. Uh, you catch too. You, Mason. Have a good one. Bye. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. Now is the perfect time to work at Amazon. They are offering hourly jobs with great pay and even include a large sign-on bonus. No matter where you're at in the job market, you can select from a variety of available roles in your area. Join an exciting work environment and be part of a team that brings smiles to customers every day. To find the job that works for you and some extra cash, go to Amazon.com slash apply. That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. Moms, at Vanguard, you're more than just a parent. You're the heart of the family. You're the first responder to any need. You can be the hero and the villain, sometimes on the same day. Because you know that in the end, your legacy is the values you instill in them. At Vanguard, you're more than just an investor. You're an owner. Because the future you're building is bigger than yourself. Discover the value of ownership at Vanguard.com. Fund shareholders own the funds that own Vanguard. Vanguard Marketing Corporation. Distributor.